The 21. Questions with Luciano. The 1950s marked a significant period of transformation for organized crime, and the 1960s promised to be even more tumultuous. In the 1950s, major changes swept through the ranks of crime bosses. Notably, in 1957, Lucky Luciano had no choice but to step down as the head of the Luciano family, as Russell Buffalino, Joe Barbera, and other organized crime members played roles in organizing the ill-fated Appalachian meeting. This meeting was attended by numerous heavyweights in organized crime and was intended to see Vito Genovese ascend as boss of the Luciano family and Carlo Gambino rise as boss of the Anastasia crime family. However, suspicious activities surrounding Joe Barbera's properties drew the attention of local law enforcement, and in 1957, organized crime came out of the shadows. This once secretive organization, despite the FBI's claims that it didn't exist, was now exposed to the public eye. The 50s was a decade of transformation, and the 60s appeared to be a decade of conflict. In 1958, Lucky Luciano began to realize that his reign as the boss of bosses was over. While he wasn't ready to give up easily, he understood that he might never return to the United States or lead his organization again. This realization didn't faze him much, because Luciano was a man who accepted both the good and the mistakes in his life. Charlie by the mid-fifties had changed completely. Instead of building casinos, he was building hospitals and churches. He took care of the poor rather than extorting them. He helped the orphans instead of recruiting them. He became a real godfather to his own godson. He was happy, but still, he felt like he was being robbed by his so-called friends back home in New York. But he stopped caring. Red Levine visited Charlie and met Igea. Red instantly fell in love with Igea. Red looked at Charlie and could not believe he managed to fall in love back in Italy of all places. Red would inform Charlie about the tide changing back home in America. What he didn't fully grasp was just how powerful his organization had become. By 1958, it was collaborating with multiple intelligence agencies and even on the brink of influencing another election. Despite being on shaky ground, the Mafia still held considerable influence. Additionally, the Mafia had to make quick decisions regarding the situation in Cuba, where Fidel Castro's rise to power left many Mafia members uncertain. Some, including the Southern Mafia and Santo Traficante, had supported Castro, hoping to gain favor once he assumed power. Politics, it seemed, extended beyond Washington into the Mafia's ranks. Luciano decided to step down, observing the unfolding events, while he, in 1958, lived the life of an ordinary businessman who fulfilled some of his dreams. Among them was building hospitals and assisting the impoverished people of Sicily and Naples. Luciano was deeply moved by the poverty he witnessed in Italy, and he did his best to help his fellow Italians. However, he couldn't escape his notoriety as a narcotics trafficker, underworld figure, and one of the most dangerous men in the world. He was also known as the boss of bosses and a gangster, and these labels haunted him. Luciano and his wife had to fight legal battles to prove his innocence, and that he was no longer in control of criminal enterprises. As his public image deteriorated, Luciano retreated into a private life in 1958 rarely going out, especially at night. He was content with the fact that others were now in charge of his empire, having followed a similar path of displacing their predecessors. However, he remained determined to clear his name, especially in the eyes of American authorities who had tarnished his reputation through the Kefauva and McClellan hearings. In 1958, Luciano granted an interview to a couple of journalists who had connections to his wife Igea. While he was initially uncomfortable with uninvited visitors, he agreed to the interview to please his wife. The resulting article, published in Confidential magazine, is the last interview he ever gave to an outsider. His next public interaction would be with author Martin Gosch. This article provides a glimpse into the life and mindset of Lucky Luciano during this period, 
offering a piece of historical insight into the world of organized crime in the mid-20th century. Here is the article. Naples, Italy. It's been more than a decade since Charles Lucky Luciano, once a kingpin of American organized vice and crime, was deported to his native Italy as an undesirable alien. There have been all sorts of wild tales about Lucky since then. It's been said that he wallows in fantastic luxury, surrounded by platoons of strong arm guards. He's been accused of everything from murder and mayhem to stealing stewed carrots off vegetarian blue plate lunches. Cops and writers and politicians have charged him with being the mastermind behind a gigantic international crime cartel. He's been called a smuggler, currency juggler, the head of a worldwide dope ring. My wife and I were given the confidential assignment to find Lucky Luciano, run down the rumours and reports, and, if possible, prevail upon the one-time gangland czar to talk. It wasn't easy. The toughest job of all was separating the facts from the hogwash, sifting the truth out of the oceans of sheep dip that had been written and rumoured about Luciano. Hold no grudge against him. We spent ten days in the Naples area on the Luciano story. We checked and rechecked every lead. We interviewed more than 100 people, including Lucky Luciano himself. We got plenty of surprises. Strangely enough, Sylvia and I wound up liking Charlie Luciano personally. This admission won't win us many friends among headline-hungry moralists or holier-than-thou do-gooders. It is, however, the way we feel. Whatever he may have been before, this new Lucky Luciano is a likeable cuss. Not even the members of the big official American colony Naples hold any grudge against him. We talked to a dozen or so of the officials in the United States Consulate General on the Piazza Principe di Napoli, all admitted that most of the sensational yarns coming out of Italy about Luciano were pure hokum. For example, one of the naturalization service officers attached to the consulate knows quite a bit about Lucky. It was the INS that deported Luciano and other undesirable alien gangsters. Yet, this federal agent told us not about Lucky's crimes or record, but about his unpublicized charities. Check up on what Charlie did at San Sebastiano, the US officer suggested. It'll be worth it. It was worth it as an illuminating sidelight on the character of the man many believe is a rock-hard racketeer to this day. Some Surprising Comments San Sebastiano is a tiny, poverty-raddled village high on the blighted slopes of Mount Vesuvius. As in most such Italian villages, the single church is the centre and heart of all community affairs. The church at San Sebastiano was destroyed by an eruption of Vesuvius. Don Chico, the village padre, was unable to raise the money to have it rebuilt. Quietly, without fanfare or publicity, Luciano put up the dough for the project. I do not know what Signor Luciano was or did in the past, says Don Chico simply, but he is a good man now. We heard many such stories from Americans, Italian detectives, and everyday citizens of Naples. They told of Lucky helping out this person or that hospital of Luciano anonymously supporting a charity or aiding an indigent family. As for Charles Lucky, Luciano himself, we expected to find a gangster type straight out of a Class B movie and all right Louis dropped the gun character, roosting in a swanky, flashy mansion. Instead, his apartment is nice, but not plush. Lucky's home is a rented, top-floor flat in a middle-class apartment building on the Via Tasso, overlooking the Bay of Naples. It's nice, but certainly not plush. In the States, the rent in a similar building would run around $125 per month. In Italy, it's about half that. Many different kinds of people live in Luciano's apartment building. Some are Italian businessmen and their families. One or two tenants are Americans who work in the NATO headquarters in Naples. Several of them lived there for months without realizing the true identity of the Signor Luciano in Appartamento Numero 9. They agree, Lucky is a good tenant and neighbour. He's home every night by 9.09.30 at the latest, 
they informed us. He doesn't have much company. The first we went to visit Charlie Luciano were unexpected and unannounced. The single elevator was out of order. No one stopped us or asked us where we were going. We hiked up four sets of stairs and found his door. That was the easiest part of the assignment. It was that easy to invade the private stronghold of the secret ruler of the underworld. We rang the doorbell and the door was opened by a greying medium-sized man wearing short-sleeved shirt and slightly rumpled dark trousers. He blinked at us through rimless bifocals. Except for the fading tattoos on his forearm, he looked like a somewhat tired Middle Western high school principal. Unbelievable, perhaps, but nonetheless true. Lucky Luciano was a lot more nervous than we were. He asked us in and tried to be hospitable, but he was ill at ease. He told us he could not relax around writers. Most he met have blasted, some perhaps with ample justifications, but others for the sheer hell of it, he believes. Alone with Luciano The apartment was simple but comfortable. A sofa and chairs, with well-laundered slipcovers, newspapers and magazines on a scarred office table, low bookcases, flanking a fireplace. The TV set was blaring, Luciano turned it off. I don't go out much at night anymore he offered with an apologetic gesture. There were no guards or torpedoes around. We were alone with Lucky Luciano. It was around 10pm and we barged in on him the way you'd barge in on the guy down the street. We knew, of course, that in the daytime, Lucky is a small businessman. He distributes electric supplies and manufactures metal office and hospital furniture. Stateside newspapers occasionally allege that these are merely fronts for racket operations. We check on these reports with Italian police and agents of the Ufico Straniere, the outfit that keeps an eye on all the deportees in Italy. In Naples, the Ufico Straniere is headed by Dattore Guglielmo Cerasso. It's no secret that him and his men have been closely observing every move Charlie Luciano has made for over ten years. We asked them if they thought Lucky was running any dope rings or rackets. El Ridicoloso, they had snorted. His businesses are a big headache for him. He has no time for other things. Besides, he is watched closely because of his past records. Everyone knows him by sight. It is impossible for Luciano to even spit on the sidewalk without the policia knowing the full details immediately. He was reluctant to give an interview. We started out conversation with Lucky Luciano by telling him what we learned about him. I don't hurt anybody, he shrugged. I leave them alone. I don't get in anybody's way. I felt no qualms about asking Luciano for a straightforward no-holds-bar interview. He hesitated. No, he finally said he'd rather not be interviewed. Why I inquired. It won't do any good. People back in America got their ideas about me. I am an ex-con, and they only want to hear about mobs and vice. I guess that's the way it gotta be. I don't think I ought to give any interviews. We didn't get out for the interview that night. Lucky made us some coffee, and we drank it, and went home. Several more days were needed before he would agree to let me toss questions at him. OK, he finally told me over the phone. I'll come down to your hotel. It won't do any good, but I guess I can't lose anything either. Luciano showed up in the lobby. It was mid-afternoon. He was wearing a short-sleeved shirt as before. He was alone, and this surprised us. What anyone else to sit in on this? I asked him. Sylvia and I had expected him to bring a lawyer or a press advisor, or at the very least a couple of friends to act as witnesses to what he said to us. What for? Luciano snapped. Can I trust you or not? There didn't seem to be an answer to that one. We found a quiet corner in the nearly deserted lobby. I offered Luciano a drink, then a cigarette. He refused both. My doctor says I can't, he grunted unhappily. No smoke, no liquor, some tough guy, huh? We settled on coffee and then didn't waste any more time. We got down to the business of the interview. These are the questions I asked Lucky Luciano in the lobby of the Terminus Hotel in Naples. And these are his answers, just the way he gave them. Neither Sylvia nor I are clairvoyant. We cannot read minds. And thus we cannot vouch for the truth or accuracy of Luciano's replies. 
We can, however, attest to the fact that he answered my questions with every indication of candor and honesty. In our opinion, he gave us straight answers. And that's one of the reasons we ended up liking Lucky Luciano. Question 1. Before you were deported from the United States, your prison sentence had been commuted by the state of New York. At that time, there were stories that this was a reward for providing information and contacts that helped Allied forces land in Sicily during World War II. It was said your help made the invasion and conquest of the island much easier. A great deal of controversy has raged over this since then. Will you set the record straight on this matter now, once and for all? Answer. I did nothing in the war. I didn't do anything. Some government representatives came to see me while I was in the penitentiary. They asked me for information. You know, stuff about Sicily and the names of friends or relatives who'd helped the American army and navy before and after the soldiers got ashore. Hello, I left Sicily when I was six years old. I couldn't be much help. I'll tell you the inside story, though. The whole Sicily invasion deal was made easy by the Masons. There's a big Masonic organization down there, even though most people don't know it. The Masons, they're the guys who did the work. Question 2. Then why was your sentence commuted? Answer. I'd rather not talk about it. Question 3. It's generally believed that you left the States with a fortune and that you've got millions of dollars stashed away. What can you tell us about your finances? Answer. I landed in Italy with $25,000. I got some more money after that. Friends brought it over to me and don't ask me who they were. What dough I had, I used to get my businesses started. Now I make out pretty good. I'm fixed, okay. But I'm not rich by a hell of a shot. I'm still a long way from having just one million. Question 4. What about the charge heard in the States? That you were involved in smuggling automobiles? and engaged in illicit financial transactions in Italy. Answer. A friend of mine brought a 1948 Oldsmobile to Italy. When he went back home, he left the car with me. I applied for an Italian permit to keep the car to naturalize it. The papers got held up. Before they went through, the Italian police discovered I was using an American car that was still registered to an American. They didn't like the idea, but they let me keep the Olds. That got blown up into the smuggling story. Question 5. And the money deals? Answer. Yeah. I was involved in shady money deals, just the same way any tourist was, who came over here in the 1940s, and even up to 51 and 52. I changed my dough on the streets. I didn't go to the banks where they were giving official rates of exchange for dollars. I found the guys in the hotel lobbies and cafes, who gave you what the dollar was really worth in Liar. That got back to America, and the next thing I knew, I was being called a big-time international money juggler. Question 6. You sound bitter about the American press answer. Look, I'm not bitter. I'm just tired of reading crackpot yarns about myself. Like the ones that have me running all over Italy with ex-cons, as bodyguards characters you writers say, pack shoulder holsters and tommy guns. My God, anybody walking down the street with me and carrying so much as a water pistol would be nailed by the Italian cops. You can't pack a gun in Italy, and I'm one guy they're always watching. That's the kind of stuff that makes me leery of you writers. Question 7. Every now and then, a story pops up that you're involved in the narcotics racket. If... Here Luciano broke in angrily. Police, keep an eye on him. Answer. Sure, sure. And I tried to burn down the White House and hid bombs in the Empire State Building. You people don't think. They've got laws, all kinds of laws here in Italy. Can you see a guy with my record getting away with anything? The local police, US narcotics agents, Interpol, and God only knows who else, all work on dope cases. Do you think I'd be out and running around loose if I was mixed up with any of that stuff? I'm lucky, Luciano. They'd have me in the can the minute they had anything more than a pipe dream to go on. 
Question 7. Senator Estes Kefava claimed that you're still active in the rackets. Answer. Nuts. Kefava was out to make headlines and a big name for himself. Question 8. Then you don't think Senate investigations do any good? Answer. I didn't say that. Some investigations are plain ballyhoo. The people who run them are looking for free publicity. They don't care who they hit or what they say. Some are pretty good like the one they've been running on the labor unions. It's about time somebody cleaned that racket up. Question 8. You mean there are good rackets and bad rackets? Answer. Don't try and play hotshot cross-examiner with me, huh? I've been up in front of some of the best. All I said was that labor rackets should be cleaned up. The little guy, the working guy, is the one who gets hurt by them. Question 9. How do you feel toward other investigative agencies? The Federal Bureau of Investigation, for example. Answer. The FBI? Are you kidding? Those boys know what they're doing. That's one bunch you can't get to. Nobody can. They're the best cops and they're level. Question 10. Would you say there are other cops you could or can get to? Answer. Let's drop it, huh? Okay. Suppose we take up an, another subject. Question 11. How many deportees men in the same boat as yourself would you say there are in Italy? Many deportees in Italy answer. I don't know exactly. About 600, maybe. Question 12. How are they making out? Answer. Lousy. Most of them got over here without a dime. Lots of them don't even know how to talk Italian. They'd gone to America when they were just kids. Question 12. I know there are about two million unemployed in Italy. Do these deportes have jobs? Answer. Nah. They don't have any trades or professions. Some of them try and pick up a few bucks here and there during the tourist season, showing American tourists around. A lot of them left their wives and families in the States. Here their own relatives won't talk to them because they're ex-cons and broke. Question 13. Do you have much contact with these deportees? Answer. Sure. They look me up. They all ways figure. I'm good for a few hundred lire. An American dollar is worth 620 lire. Or a meal. They've got no one else to ask for help. They know I'm here. And that I've at least got a business. So, they come around. Question 14. Did you know these men in America? Answer. I never saw most of them before in my life. But they've all heard about me. I'm not hard to find. You discovered that yourself. Things are different here. Question 15. How has Italy treated you, or to put it another way, how do you personally find things here? Answer. I said I was doing okay. I've got a lot of friends in that way. I'm really rich. I don't hurt anybody, and not many people go out of their way to hurt me anymore. I had to get used to the European way of living and doing business. That was tough. Things are done a lot differently here from the way they're done in the States. Everything moves a lot slower. I had to get used to it. Question 16. What's your view on the situation in the United States? Politically, first of all. Answer. Oh, brother. Don't figure me for an answer one way or another on that one. Question 17. How about from an economic standpoint? Answer. All I know is what I read and hear. I don't do any export business. It looks like everybody's got dough and things are rolling pretty well. Question 17. All right then, let's go out on a limb. What's your opinion on the present-day American wave of juvenile delinquency and crime? Answer. Those punks are crazy. They think they're tough, but they're just cheap punks. The yellow little punks couldn't be tough if they tried. I was reading where they're ganging up and killing cripples and old men, and even where 10 and 11-year-old kids are at it. Question 18. Yeah, I think it's pretty much true. But what do you think is the cause? What can be done to stop it? Movies cause delinquency. Answer. I know a lot about kids who mess up. I've seen enough of them, God knows. A lot of people blame it on parents and schools. Not me. 
I blame it all on movies and television. Not all, maybe, but most of it. Movies and TV make big dough glorifying tough crime. Sure. I know the boys in the business claim it's all with a moral, but they don't believe it themselves. They show murders and robberies, and the real hero, the ham who gets all the attention, is the strong-armed jerk, the torpedo. It's been like that for years and keeps getting worse. I've seen hundreds, maybe thousands of kids go really bad. I'll stake anything you want. Most of them got their ideas from movies and television shows. Hell, a kid can learn how to torture his sister or knock off his old man by going to the movies. Stop glorifying the tough monkey and the bird who carries a knife or a gun and your juvenile trouble will take a nosedive in nothing flat. I know what makes kids bad. Question 19. Then you really blame teenage crime on Hollywood and TV? Answer. You're damn right I do. I blame it on the blood and guts and crime movies and all that stuff. If anyone should know about what makes kids turn sour, I guess I should. Question 20. I meant to ask you this earlier. Going back to the guys who were deported, do you think any of them might go to work on goon squads for the Italian communists? Answer. That's a laugh. No, I don't. Whatever these guys are, they're all pretty strong for free enterprise. I never heard of one going communist. Question 21. What do you think of their future and yours will be in Italy? Answer. They'll get along, I guess. I know I will. To end this on a final note, is there anything you'd like to say in addition to what we've gone over? Luciano's final response was, Yeah, I've given you a straight interview with straight answers. I'd like to see it printed that way. The end of the Confidential Magazine article with Luciano. His last every interview. Please like and subscribe to my channel.